Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program, and I'm the Henry Kissinger Chair here at CSIS. Um, and we are very happy to have you here for this um, plenary. American public opinion on foreign policy and national security does seem to be shifting in important ways. We're going to talk today about whether really there are important shifts. As we were thinking of putting together this global security forum, well before the presidential election, we focused pretty early on this issue of evolving opinion on foreign policy. And we wondered, is, uh, is there an American consensus on foreign policy? Has there been one? And if there has been one, is it fracturing? Um, is there more continuity or change in terms of what we are seeing through polling data and through the electoral process? Um, CSIS is hardly alone in, in asking these questions, and that's why we've assembled this particular panel today, uh, each of whom, each member of whom brings, I think, a really unique and interesting perspective to the issue. Um, to my right is Carol Doherty. He's the Director of Political Research at the Pew Research Center. He and his colleagues released Pew's most recent annual report on public opinion on America's role in the world in April. Its title perhaps says it all, Public Uncertain, Divided Over America's Place in the World, and it is subtitled Growing Support for Increased Defense Spending. Dina Smeltz uh, is next here on our panel. She is a senior fellow on public opinion and foreign policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She and her colleagues released their latest survey of American public opinion and US foreign policy in October, and it is entitled America in the Age of Uncertainty. Perhaps you sense a theme. <laughs> Miki Oyang is the Vice President for the National Security Program at Third Way. Mika describes her role in Third Way as in part, quote, closing the credibility gap, excuse me, between Democrats and Republicans on security issues. Along with her colleague Ben Freeman in late September, Mika published a piece noting the shrinking size of Republicans' historical advantage in Americans' opinions on which party is better able to protect the nation. Noting that this so-called security gap, as assessed by Gallup, is a key indicator of how the two major parties will perform in elections. Third Way saw some hope for their mission in the decline of Republicans' advantage from 23 points in 2014 to a seven-point gap in 2016. That's the same size gap that candidate Barack Obama faced and successfully overcame in 2008. Dr. Trevor Th Thrall is to the right of Mika. He is the senior fellow at the Cato Institute and associate professor at George Mason University. He's also a fellow MIT alum. In 2009, he published an edited volume entitled American Foreign Policy and the Politics of Fear, Threat Inflation Since 9-11. In 2015, Trevor and his colleague published a report assessing the foreign policy views of the millennial generation, which, the co which is the cohort of those born between about 1980 and 1997, and it is the largest today generational cohort. The report argues that millennials' views on foreign policy are different in three critical ways from those of their elders. First, they perceive the world as significantly less threatening. Second, they are more supportive of international cooperation. And third, they are far less supportive of the use of military force and, according to the report, quote, may have internalized a permanent case of Iraq aversion. At the end of the row here, we have Max Boot, who is the Jean J. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow for National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Among Max's prolific writings on US foreign and security policy is a recent foreign policy piece from October that perhaps best sums up the views of some conservative foreign policy thinkers at least prior to the presidential election. And it was entitled, What the Hell Happened to My Republican Party? <laughs> Here is an excerpt. As someone who has been laboring in my own small way to advance conservative principles since the 1980s, I am shell-shocked to find that so many people who were supposedly on my side are actually on Trump's side. I don't know what the Republican Party stands for anymore. Is it still the party of principled conservatism, promoting freedom at home and abroad? Or has it permanently become the party of conspiracy-mongering, authoritarianism, and white power? OK, we are definitely, I think, as you can see, going to have a very rich discussion here with the right cast of characters on, on these issues of public views on foreign policy. 
Um, before we get into our discussion, we want to share with you a video that I think further will help tee up the conversation um, and set the stage a little further. So without further ado, why don't we uh, play the video and we'll get into the discussion. I believe in strong alliances, clarity in dealing and with our rivals. Aleppo? What is the very, okay. very, Bring it. very last And I take the oil. And I Populism, border walls, retrenchment, and protectionism. While foreign policy is often overshadowed by economic concerns, contrasting visions of America's role in the world have played a major part in the recent election cycle. This contentious campaign season saw some of the basic tenets of U.S. foreign policy since the end of World War II called into question. Does this heightened acrimony over key aspects of U.S. international engagement reflect trends toward isolationism? It may seem unprecedented, but it is in fact not new. Today's controversies are continuations of debates that have lasted for decades. While support for the nation playing an active part in global affairs has remained strong since 1947, public opinion on key components of U.S. international engagement, such as defense spending, has waxed and waned over the last 70 years in response to economic trends, military interventions, and domestic priorities. In the first decades of the Cold War, America was committed to international engagement as a part of its strategy of containment against the existential threat presented by the Soviet Union. The U.S. experience in Vietnam, however, created an aversion to overseas military engagements that lasted from the late 1960s through the 70s. During the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union led the U.S. public and policymakers to again question defense spending levels, foreign aid, and forward military presence. Many thought the limited interventions of Desert Storm in Kosovo would serve as models for future military operations. Then came September 11, 2001. Our response to the events of that day have largely defined contemporary American foreign policy since. First came the long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Their unsatisfactory outcomes left much of the public and policymaking elites disillusioned with large-scale military engagements. The result of that disillusionment has been an increasing reliance on small footprint forces for a variety of contingency operations, including in the global war on terror. At home, the most severe recession since the Great Depression exacerbated America's growing reservations about global engagement. As the economy recovered at an anemic pace, income inequality ballooned. Fewer were able to reap the benefits of our globalized economy. Opposition to free trade and large-scale immigration grew. Now, eight years after the recession and the more than 15 after 9-11, views on the desirability of America's international engagement strategy are fractured. For the first time ever in 2009, and again in 2013, most Americans responded that the U.S. should mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can on their own. This comes at the same time that more people are concerned about major domestic terror attacks than in 2002, just months after 9-11. Do these polls reflect temporary reactions to the state of public affairs? Or is there a genuine trend toward retrenchment in the American public? Democrats and Republicans now disagree on the benefits of free trade, alliances, and multilateral approaches. Divergences in threat perceptions and approaches to international engagement have also grown between the American public and policymakers. <coughs> as history shows, this is not a new debate in American politics. Yet, as distance from World War II and the Cold War grows, the rationale for a U.S. foreign policy of engagement may be growing less clear to younger generations. If the new administration decides that sustaining a strategy premised on deep international engagement is best suited for the advancement of American interests, it will have to do a better job of communicating the rationale for those policies to create a foreign policy the American public can get behind. If, on the other hand, the new administration seeks to chart a new course for American foreign policy, it will have to find avenues of consensus among an increasingly fractured public. So we've purposely pulled together a mix of polling professionals and security analysts um, to bring these two communities together. But I'm going to start uh, with our polling specialists. And Carol, why don't we start with you and the work that you have done at Pew and then ask Dina the same question. What are the, really the key takeaways you think that uh, folks who are, if you will, laboring in the field of foreign and security policy and those who are elected officials to implement that policy? 
what are the takeaways they should have from what we're seeing in trends in U.S. foreign and security policy? Well, I think you hit on the word. I mean, I hadn't noticed that we both, uh, the Chicago Council and our our report in April and May on foreign policy used the word uncertainty. I think that's kind of the theme of where the public is. There's, you know, foreign policy is, is seldom the dominant issue in a presidential campaign. It wasn't this year, really. Um, but uh, the public itself is, is a little bit at sea. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not an isolationist mood as opposed to kind of a wariness about the benefits of global engagement and, uh, and certainly reservations. You know, as you noted in the video, uh, the, certainly the two wars have had an impact on Americans' attitudes about U.S. military engagement abroad. I think if you, if you characterize the Republican view at this point, at least the Trump supporters, and I know Max is, is of the view, you know, that he will talk about Republicans and Trump, but you know, the, the Trump supporters now have, I think, his, his messaging on, on America first certainly has had an impact in some areas, especially in trade, I think, on immigration, things like that. Democrats seem to be a little bit divided at this point. I think you do see uh, kind of a liberal moderate split on some issues. So both parties are going to have to reconcile this going ahead. Do you know what are what did you all see that you think we should take away from the Chicago Council work? Yeah, sure. Um, well. I guess I would disagree with the characterization of seeing retrenchment that the video seemed to hit on. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in our data, um, we see not just in the um, graph that you showed about the two thirds of American support taking an active role in world affairs, but we actually asked another question that was um, about US leadership in the world that right. actually Pew has asked right. before. Mm -hmm. And it's whether Americans support a dominant role for the United States, a shared role, or no leadership role at all. And fewer than one in 10 have, I think they're gonna put it up now, I think it's towards yeah. the end. Fewer than one in 10, regardless of political affiliation, say the United States should play no leadership role at all. And as they have in the past, most say that we should have a shared leadership role. So, and it's not just that, the question after question about um, NATO, Americans across political stripes say that we should maintain or even increase our uh, U.S. commitment to NATO. They overall still see NATO as essential, though Trump supporters were a little bit lower. Um, they think alliances are important. They, they support the bases overseas. Um, in some cases, support for the use of U.S. troops to defend South Korea, if North, I'm sorry, North Korea, if South Korea is attacked, um, is at its highest level that we've seen. So we didn't really get a sense at all of retrenchment. And in fact, given that fears of terrorism were up, yes, um, we actually saw bipartisan majority supporting all kinds of actions to take against terrorism. But the two things that stood out in our poll, which are related to foreign policy, but are also related to domestic policy and I think affect people more directly are trade, where we saw big differences that surprisingly over the last decade um, and a half, Democrats are actually more pro-free trade than Republicans in data, which you know, normally I think of the Republican Party as being holding the view that trade is an engine of growth and so it's surprising that to me that the um, electorate for the Republicans didn't fully appreciate that as much as Democrats seem to. And the other thing is immigration, which mm -hmm. was very big in this election. Donald Trump, very first speech, um, brought it up, and, and that is something that really divides Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. Are there um, underlying either word groups or um, trend lines that are cyclical, for instance, when this ha where, they, where these um, polls occur in the course of, for instance, U.S. presidential terms. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, um, indications like that where the economy is, where, where you have seen um, explanations, we could start with you, Carol, that maybe aren't self-evident when people are looking at individual responses? Well, I, I think the, the, the polling we've done, and, and Dean is right and everything she said, there's still this sort of baseline support for engagement. I think it's a matter of degree, really, that's what we debate about. Um, but but um, I think over the course of the campaign, what's interesting in terms of Trump's message in particular is what clicked and what didn't. 
I think the NATO message he originally uh, came up with, maybe rethink the terms of our uh, arrangement with NATO, really didn't. I think there's strong support for NATO across party lines. Maintain, you know, most people see the alliance as really important. Trade, on the other hand, you see this Trump effect. Uh, as, as recently as last month, we, we uh, updated our polling on uh, free trade agreements. Are they good or bad for the U.S.? Very blunt question, obviously, but uh, you see the Republican line just slipping down uh, further, and I think that trade Colin, message... Collins just pulled that up. Right. Is this the one you you're see thinking the, of? You see the trade message there uh, just resonating with Republican voters. And I think it does, it does go to what happened in the election, especially in those, in those key states in the Midwest uh, that were so crucial to Trump's victory. That's, that's, that's one of the areas where that message resonated. Mm -hmm. so, but, but to say that the Trump message resonated across the board would be incorrect. I think even on immigration, uh, you know, his latest, he's been a little unclear about what he's going to do to fill, fulfill his immigration <coughs> promises as president, but he's talked about deporting three million criminals, uh, possibly, uh, cr people who have committed crimes in the United States who are here <coughs> illegally. You know, our polling doesn't go to that, but we still find strong support for a path to legal status, even among Republicans, and only 32% of Republican voters told us that they wanted a, a, quote, national law enforcement effort to deport all undocumented immigrants. So. You know, how he squares all that will be interesting in the months to come, but even among his own supporters, there's a lot of doubts about some of the things he said <coughs> in the campaign. And, yeah, I agree. And I would just add, I think the, one of the potent messages that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders also um, brought to the fore was that average people and working class people are being left out of, uh, and are being neglected, and um, that the governing political class doesn't care about the needs of um, the workers. And I think Trump spoke to them and gave them a voice that they didn't have before. And, and I, uh, to some people, not everybody, some people just voted strictly on partisan lines. But I think the message that I hear you I understand your pain and your fears, mm -hmm. and I'm going to stand up for you. I think that was a powerful message. And, and again, on the Democratic side, too, I think Bernie Sanders got some of that mm -hmm. outsider support um, for being not uh, the, the average established politician. And, and one, you know, when you look at those trend lines, what's interesting now is, is where both parties go from here, you know, obviously uh, on the basis of Trump's policies. We saw Democratic support, as Dina noted, more Democratic than Republican support for, for free trade, which is kind of a historical anomaly. But where do Democrats go from here in terms of the Sanders message versus the Clinton message, which was more nuanced, although she did, did walk away from uh, support from TPP. Yeah. And that is somewhat of a reflection of changing demographics over time of the parties, that uh, right now the Republican Party has a, a, a about a third of the Republican Party um, is from, is, is, the supporters are non-college educated whites. And it used to be that that was a larger chunk among Democrats, but now it's a larger right. chunk among Republicans. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So that has right. some impact on attitudes towards trade and why we've right. seen some higher support for Dems because there's been right. a shift. Right. Yep. Um, this is perhaps a perfect segue to, <laughs> to Mika, who um, sort of represents an organization focused on the Democratic Party, and where it goes on security issues is certainly her bailiwick. So, Mika, what do you make of what you've seen in polling data? You all track, a, you do some of your own polling, but you also track a lot of polling, and um, you have an advocacy role, if you will, in terms of promoting the Democratic Party in this area. You know, what do you think the big takeaways are at this point? So I think we were really hopeful based on the numbers in early fall that Democrats had done a much better job on security. If you'd watched the Democratic National Convention, you saw that Hillary Clinton really leaned into a strong security message in a way that you hadn't seen Democrats do in decades. Um, and so you saw the American people responding to that. One of the things, though, I think many of us were really stunned by the election, having been watching the polls carefully all the way along, is that I don't want to overread the polls then or now, since 
they kind of let me down. Um, but I think that, and so when you look at the exit polls this cycle, and you look at the number of people who were ranking their top issues, and the economy was the number one issue for people this cycle, 52% of the people said economy was the no number one issue. And of those people, they gave Hillary Clinton the advantage. And there were a number of other issues that were in the top three, or there was another issue in the top three, where she had the advantage. She had the advantage on commander in chief, she had the advantage on experience, but none of those, you know, obviously she's not the president elect at this moment. And so it, it's clear from looking at that, it wasn't that people were motivated by their number one issue set to pick the president, right? Uh, there was a fairly substantial proportion of the people who said that Donald Trump was not qualified either to be commander in chief or temperamentally unqualified to be commander in chief, yet voted for him anyway. And so then you have to start asking yourself, looking at some of this data, what was underneath that? What were some of the gut instincts and concerns that people had? And one of the things that we've been looking at and I think is of tremendous concern for the national security establishment, is declining trust in institutions. And in particular, I think we have a uh, chart here. Um, let me take a little bit to get to it. Here, Sorry. Whoops, that was it, that last, last one. one. Yeah. Um, this is actually Gallup data, it's not ours. Um, this is declining trust in government and the percentage of people who say they trust the government to handle international problems. And you can see uh, in the 21st century that that trust has declined tremendously. So even if policymakers are making an argument that they have the policy right, the public is split on whether or not they can actually accomplish the stated policy goal. And you saw that particular as a hangover from the Iraq war. So when you look at people's declining trust in institutions, there's another factor that goes along with that, um, and that's actually the rise of people registering as independents. And my colleagues here will say, look, the, re the independents are actually um, partisans in disguise, but there is something very fundamental about someone who chooses to register as an independent rather than registering in one of the two parties, and that's two things. One, they are not willing to affiliate with an institutional point of view. And two, the term independent by itself is a positive characteristic, and those are people who think, I'm going to make up my own mind about these things. So they're not necessarily trusting institutional voices to tell them how to approach a particular set of issues, which makes it a bigger challenge for policymakers as they put together a foreign policy for the country when you see declining trust and some resonance among people um, with Donald Trump supporters about NATO alliances and some of the other traditional aspects of the liberal international order. Do we, it may be that policymakers have to make the case directly to the public for those in much clearer terms and not in terms that are just understood by people with a master's in international relations. So is the takeaway from your perspective on foreign and security policy um, for the policymaking community, keep on keeping on or explain better but keep on keeping on? Where, where, would, you put the, where would you put your emphasis, if you will, going forward? I think that people are going to have, should be rethinking at a really fundamental level, some of the structures that we have, and that's not to say to throw them out, but a lot of the institutions we have in the foreign policy establishment were created during the Cold War in a particular threat environment, and I think people question whether or not those threat environments are still valuable. We are still conducting um, military operations under an authorization for use of military force that is now 16 years old. Um, people question whether or not those institutional foundations accurately reflect the security challenges that we have, and I think it's time for some <coughs> really careful strategic thinking about where we go and what we should be doing and whether or not the structures match the mission. Okay, I'm gonna skip over Trevor for the moment and go to Max and ask you the same question. What do you think, um, if anything, should be the takeaway of what we see in the polling data over time, this particular election, um, other trends as it relates to how um, you are thinking about foreign policy um, priorities and emphasis. Well, I, I confess I don't know much about uh, polling data and uh, apologize for my voice. I'm not a pack a day smoker. I'm actually just nursing a cold here, uh, but I will try to rasp my message out anyway. Um, Look, I think this election basically showed that a lot of us uh, in elite institutions like this one uh, have been living in kind of la-la land. Uh, that I think there's no question that those of us who 
uh, inhabit the swamp or the <laughs> Northeast Corridor, or whatever you want to call it, uh, have, are not necessarily in touch with what the rural uh, voters in places like uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania think about the world. Now, I would say that we're not necessarily wholly out of touch with the American people as a whole, given the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton did win the popular vote by at least two and a half million votes. Uh, this was not exactly a Trump landslide, but certainly his message of, uh, of protectionism and isolationism resonated uh, with more people uh, than I would have expected, uh, especially in some of these large Rust Belt states. And I think there's been a tendency since 1945 on the part of those of us in uh, what, for better or for worse, is called the foreign policy establishment uh, to take support for this American international role and for free trade for granted, uh, because it's basically been there since 1945. And I think this is a wake-up call that we really cannot take that for granted, uh, that in, in, in a way this is going back to the future. This is going back to the more fundamental debates about the American role in the world that we had in the early years of the Cold War and before World War II. I mean, when you look at what's happened in the Republican Party, in some ways, what we're seeing right now with this election, we'll see how long-lasting it is, but we're seeing in some ways the undoing of the decision that Republicans made in 1952 uh, when they selected General Eisenhower over Robert Taft as their, as their standard bearer, which was the moment when they really vanquished that pre-World War II isolationist ethos from a leadership role in the Republican Party. And now, of course, it's come roaring back. The one caveat I would add there is that uh, although there is a lot of support for what we might call Trumpism out there in the hinterland, it is not 100% clear to me yet to what extent uh, Donald J. Trump is himself a Trumpkin, uh, because uh, he has taken so many different positions over the course of the campaign and over the course of the last several decades, it's very hard to predict how he will in fact act. And it's striking to me to see the people who are being discussed as the senior appointees in his administration. I mean, when you look at the folks who are being talked about at State and Defense, uh, people like Jim Mattis, Dave Petraeus, uh, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, John Kelly, uh, a few others, uh, a few other names out there in the mix. I can't think of a single one of them that actually agrees with Trump on foreign policy. Not a single one of them would be characterized as an isolationist or a protectionist. I think that view might perhaps be more represented in the White House uh, by General Flynn, although his, his worldview, I think, remains very much to be fleshed out. Uh, and uh, you know, presumably by Steve Bannon as well, although his worldview also, I think, in foreign policy remains to be fleshed out. But I think, you know, there will be, there's no question that this, uh, that this isolationist, protectionist message either helped Trump to win the election or, at the very least, did not prevent him from winning the election. Let's put it that way. If you assume that he won the election basically on a cult of personality, certainly his message was, did not appear to be a, a serious hindrance. It may have been a help. But I think it still remains to be seen to what extent this will actually be a long-lasting shift. And a lot of it will really depend on, on the Trump administration. Are they actually going to destroy NATO? Are they going to kowtow to Russia? Are they going to tear up NAFTA? Are they going to get into trade wars with China? Uh, I'm, at the moment, maybe very mildly optimistic that most of that will not happen. But it remains to be determined. So Trevor, uh, Max referred to it as a wake-up call to the, and now using my words, maybe the foreign policy elite. Um, my suspicion is you may be the least surprised person on this panel about uh, where American public opinion has been going on foreign policy. Um, that's, that probably is unfair to the pollsters here, but let's just stick to the foreign policy elite on the panel. Um, what are your thoughts about um, how lasting, how much we should read into polling data, the election, et cetera, what you're seeing on foreign policy, and how lasting you think it is, and what we should do about it? Uh, great questions. I, I agree with pretty much everything everyone has said so far, so I'll try to say something else new. But I think, I think Trump does, as Max mentioned, represent the most significant challenge to the bipartisan, in my view, the bipartisan inside the Beltway consensus on foreign policy since the, the end of the Cold War. I mean, I think the end of the Cold War presented such a challenge. What do we do next? And I'm not sure we figured it out yet. Um, but to the extent we figured it out, Trump doesn't like it. And I think he, um, 
as incons inconsistent, as incoherent as he sometimes sounds on foreign policy, I think his nationalism and protectionism is, is a, just a, a huge left turn. I, I'm skeptical that he can pull it off. There's no, there are no Trumpists to hire uh, to flesh out a cabinet and, a, and an administration or a, you know, a State Department or a Pentagon. So I, I'm not sure how deep he can go. Um, but to the extent he's paying attention and driving the ship, you, you have to worry about at least some specific cases. Uh, I think a broader point that the polling uh, suggests is that you know, in the absence of the existential threat of the Soviet Union, foreign policy plays a lot more like domestic politics. We can have partisan battles about what is the national interest. You know, when I went to graduate school, no one asked that question. Everyone knew what the national interest was. Is it bad for the Soviets? Do it. If it's good for the Soviets, <laughs> don't do it. It was very simple. You know, it was, grad school was a one-week course. You know, but uh, now Trump shows you that you have to decide first off what is the national interest, and his view is very different from the current consensus. Uh, what is the point of being abroad in the world? Trump thinks it's to win, uh, to get things. Uh, most of the foreign policy establishment thinks it's to do good for the rest of the world, to provide peace and stability, to uh, you know underwrite the rules of the liberal international order, and all this sort of you know highfalutin. Wilsonian or uh, what have you sort of ideals, Trump doesn't buy any of this. Um, I don't think a majority of people agree with him on most of his specific opinions, but uh, as others have mentioned, there, there is a large group of Americans, larger than I think many of us maybe realized, uh, who, who, for whom that does resonate. I'm from Michigan, so I know a lot of them. Um, so I, I think it's gonna, and I think well, I'll say one last thing is that um, because foreign policy now plays more as domestic politics, and because so much of foreign policy is president-centric. I think we're gonna see a lot more polarization around foreign policy than we used to, because TV focuses on the president and the public primes you know, and forms opinions off of the president. Now, when the president is very popular, that often helps the president build support for positions from you know, trade to military intervention. But Trump, I'm not sure Trump is ever gonna be a popular president in his first term anyway. Uh, his approval ratings, I think, are still sub 50%. Uh, and, and research has shown those presidents uh, tend to polarize rather than build support. So I, I think it's going to be tough sledding for Trump. Let's go through some of the specific issues that maybe played a role in this particular election or certainly are the foremost of the headlines um, and just talk a little bit about what we've seen there. Dina, um, we talked in the green room about specifically about t bringing up immigration and talking a little bit about immigration. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you have seen in terms of American public opinion on immigration? Yeah, so if we can call up, I have a slide that has, um, it's a line graph and it should have, Maybe it's not there. Uh, it looks like that, but it's on immigration. Is that in there? Um, it looks like that, but with a much wider gap. Um, that's fine. It doesn't look like it. it's in there. So it's if you grabbed a report on your way up, it's in there. But uh, so since we have been asking whether um, large numbers of immigrants and refugees coming into the United States is a critical threat, an important but not a critical threat, or not a threat to the United States since the 90s. And the first couple of years we asked the question, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, about two-thirds of them said that, it, that immigration is a threat. But starting, um, I think, after 1998, we saw a steady decline among Democrats uh, for the percentage of Democrats who said large numbers of immigrants and refugees coming into the United States is a threat down to minority levels. I think it's at like 40% uh, now. While Repub so it, it kind of went like that. But Republicans stayed very high up until today, and actually today it's the highest it's ever been at 67%. So it's, a, it's almost a 40% percentage point difference between Democrats and Republicans um, on whether immigration is a threat. So, um, and then this, similarly we ask about uh, whether limiting immigration should be a very important priority or not, not as important and um, um, Republicans think it should be, it's one of their top priorities. And for Democrats it doesn't weigh in at all at one of their top priorities. But um, in general, like Carol said before, a majority of Americans do support some kind of immigration reform and legalizing undocumented workers here, and that often gets 
gets left out of the mix. Mm -hmm. um, people, especially this campaign season, heard building the wall, which most polls show uh, Americans oppose it. Um, and they heard, and it heightened the, the rhetoric, but, but in reality, a majority of Americans do support legalizing things. One other thing I wanted to bring up is that um, there is some consensus, too, on what the top threats are to the United States between, mm -hmm. across political lines, and that is terrorism, nuclear proliferation, and cyber terrorism. Those are all seen as three critical threats, and Republicans add on to that um, limiting immigration and Islamic fundamentalism, where Democrats are more concerned about climate change than the yeah. other ones, so those are other yeah. dividing. Thoughts from Carol well, on well, immigration I think, and related. Right. I, the, the two, immigration and refugees. I mean, refugees uh, uh, from the Middle East quickly became a political issue in the Trump campaign. And you see almost instant polarization <coughs> in that question with 80% with plus Republicans say, say refugees from Iraq and Syria should not be allowed in the United States at all, uh, as many or more Democrats saying they should be. This is a continuation of some of the polarization we've seen on domestic issues over time. The last 20 years, we've, we've done numerous studies showing the polarization on uh, ideological and partisan polarization on domestic issues and a growth in partisan, what we call partisan antipathy or partisan animosity over the same period. You see it play out in the most recent campaign, obviously. But in, you know, foreign policy is part of this. Part foreign policy and national security are, are, are part of this. While there's some baseline agreements, yes, that the, America should play a leading role in the world on these specific issues, you find fracturing, uh, whether it be on immigration, refugees, and, and trade. I want to pick up, Dina mentioned climate, and I want to ask Trevor about climate, but then more generally, because you've looked specifically at millennials, as I'm sure others have. Um, and that seems to be a demographic divider, a generational divider. Um, so both on climate and then more generally, what do you think as we look past the 2016 election and up to 2020 and beyond, as our you know, millennial generation grows in importance um, in, the voting, in, in the voting population, um, what do you think we should have our eyes on in terms of issues? Well, <clears throat> given how the polls did this year, predicting uh, even yeah. further out in the future sounds dangerous. But um, yeah, it's interesting when you ask, uh, and I'm going <coughs> to refer here directly to Dina's uh, organization's fine polling on this stuff, but when you ask uh, different aged Americans what they worry about in the world, the, the only issue that the millennials worry about more than older Americans uh, is climate change. And I think that you know, says a lot about the fact that most of us grew up not knowing what that was, uh, whereas millennials, it's been omnipresent in their life and a big topic of conversation. That's not too hard to understand, I think. Um, millennials, of course, are also quite a bit more liberal than previous generations, um, so that may explain a little bit of it as well. Uh, you know, yet moving beyond, though, I think when you look at how millennials view some of the hot button issues of this campaign, immigration, climate change, say the Iran nuclear deal, uh, military intervention, on all of these things, millennials are qu quite a bit further from Trump um, than, than their elders. And so, although I, you know, I'm not ready to say for sure that they, their views are cemented, I think there's pretty good reason to believe that there's likely to be some sort of millennial, permanent millennial shift in, in this direction. And so I think uh, over future elections, and, and there's you know, been great work by um, Robert Jones and others about sort of the disappearance of white Christian America and the, the changing demographics of the, the two parties, it, it's going to get harder and harder to sell um, what, what I think of as has been the traditional liberal internationalist uh, strategy of, of high frequency military intervention and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, on the other hand, millennials seem, at least on paper, to be pretty copacetic with international treaties for cooperative sorts of ventures like climate change, the Paris Treaty, and so on, or the Iran nuclear deal. In fact, the interesting tidbit there is um, millennials are the only generation uh, in which a majority supported the Iran nuclear deal. If it weren't for younger Americans, there wouldn't have been a single poll that ever showed even slight majority support uh, for, that, for that deal. So I, I think politics are going to change, first with the polls, and then maybe as they start taking over, something mm -hmm. real. We'll see. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go to uh, Max and, and uh, Mika to pick up on something I've, I've probably mentioned before, but I think it makes sense to return to it, which is, you know, for the 
for those of us who work in this field, I think there is this fundamental question of how do we think about, in a, in a perhaps patronizing way, better educating those who are coming up in you know, uh, other generations who don't have a Cold War perspective or something like that? Or do we need to educate ourselves, if you will, be changed by the reality of the different ethos that's coming from the next generation? Let me just start with Max and then go to Mika. I mean, I don't, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. <laughs> do, you do you anticipate as, you know, your you and, and those you would consider like-minded on the conservative end of foreign policy to reflect upon the, both this election and, again, broader trends and views of the next generation or two coming up um, and think about how they ought to shift where you are headed intellectually or are you thinking more about how to get them to understand the intellectual basis for your positions? Well, I think obviously anybody who believes uh, in an internationalist American foreign policy and in free trade has a whale of a selling job to do, whether it's to young voters or old voters, because uh, clearly this election revealed there is not enough support for those views in general. Um, in terms of the young voters, I mean, it. I think that the that the kind of president that they experience uh, certainly has a big impact on their worldview. I mean, I grew up in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and so I was shaped by the Reagan presidency, and I've always thought of myself as being a Ronald Reagan conservative. I'm really not sure what that means anymore these days, and I can't even begin to imagine what Donald Trump conservatives would look like in the future, uh, if there are any. I mean, the, the polls actually showed that millennials were the most heavily uh, anti-Trump voters, I believe, right. out there. I, I make a very tentative foray into the realm of polling about which I know a little, but that was, that was my sense from, from what little I saw. Uh, so, you know, I do, I do wonder uh, if this will be a lost generation for the Republican Party. And I think prior to the election, when the consensus was that Hillary Clinton was gonna win, there was an expectation that the Republican Party uh, was gonna have a meltdown and there would have to be an attempt to remake it in a more popular vein after uh, Donald Trump's massive defeat at the hands of Hillary Clinton. Now, given the way things have actually played out with the Republican Party in control of both branches of Congress, of the White House, the majority of governorships, and state legislatures, you know, it's hard to say, just based on electoral reality, that the Republican Party is in such dire straits. But I do think that in the long term, there is going to be a serious issue in terms of what does the Republican Party stand for? Uh, because the kind of positions that Trump enunciated and will not necessarily act on, but at least the ones that he enunciated during the campaign are utterly at odds with conservatism and the ideals of the Republican Party as, of I, as, as I've understood them, and certainly as they are championed uh, by people like uh, Paul Ryan, uh, Mitch McConnell, and just about every other Republican in a position of power in this town. So. I think what happens with, with, with the Trump presidency will do a lot to determine the future shape of the Republican Party. Obviously, if he is, there's, you, can, you can think of many different iterations of which way he'll go. Uh, in this town, there's a lot of uh, hopeful thinking, which might be described as wishful thinking, that he's basically going to govern as a doctrinaire conservative, uh, that he will basically accede to Mike Pence, Paul Ryan, and kind of the grown up, more mainstream uh, people around him, and he will do things not very different from what Mitt Romney would have done if he had won uh, four years ago. So that's one possibility, and if that's the way it goes down, and if he has tremendous success doing that, then it may not be as fundamental a challenge to the Republican Party as many of us uh, have imagined up until now. But if that's not what happens, if he actually governs in a more erratic, Trumpian manner, similar to the way that he campaigned, uh, a lot will depend on whether he has success or not. Uh, I mean, obviously, on foreign policy. you know, success cures a lot of ills and excuses a lot of crazy rhetoric. So if, if the economy is going gangbusters, if the world is a more secure place in four years, uh, then that will be obviously a, a big selling point for whatever it is that Trump represents within the Republican Party. And if it's not the case, if that's not the case, if uh, the economy is going down the tubes and the world is going to hell in a handbasket, 
uh, that will obviously, I think, lead to the kind of rethinking and, and you know, major shift in politics that I think a lot of people expected would have happened after this election, assuming mm -hmm. that Trump had lost. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Mika, the Democratic Party, I suppose, can decide whether it won because of the popular vote or it's fundamentally threatened because it's not uh, increasing its share of early anything <laughs> at the yeah. moment. Uh, what do you think the takeaway is in terms of foreign policy? So, so for foreign policy, so for the Democratic Party generally, I think it's it's sort of hard to say between the sort of, um, Bernie Sanders wing of the party and the, uh, the Hillary Clinton wing of the party, if, if those are two separate views, um, that one of them, that the election results say that one is ascendant or the other. What you saw is that Democrats of all stripes across the board lost. You saw Russ Feingold and Zephyr Teachout, who were very liberal, lose their elections. You saw Patrick Murphy and other more conservative Democrats, um, Evan Bayh, lose as well. So it's not like you have a clear direction forward for the Democratic Party. So I think there's a lot of rethinking that needs to happen. Um, but the I don't know that the Democratic thinking on national security will change very much. I think the Democrats, what we saw over the past, uh, especially to, uh, certainly since 2014, the Democrats have, have understood the importance of understanding national security issues and how that's important and how they need to be much more responsive to people's terrorism fears. I would expect that that would continue. You see Democrats at this moment in the Senate um, pushing hard on trying to get to the bottom of Russian interference in the election, which surprising their, surprisingly their Republican colleagues have not been willing to join them with the exception of Lindsey Graham in trying to figure out when an, another sovereign nation is trying to interfere in our process for deciding how we're governing ourselves. That, that's not a concern to the security of the nation. Um, so I think you do see Democrats continuing to engage, continuing to believe in the liberal international order, but I do think there's a lot of rethinking that has to happen. Um, one of my colleagues says that one of the things we saw from this election is that Republicans wanted to live in the 1950s, but Democrats wanted to work there. And so, right, you have to, I think both parties need to do some rethinking about how do we approach the, a modern world, the internet generation, the, tra the change that we have happening, decentralization, um, and a lack of it, faith in institutions. And I think that requires a lot of very hard thought that I'm not sure people are willing to put in, especially if the Democratic Party is going to, at this moment, say, we are just the party of opposition. And if Trump wants it, we are against it, um, and not rethink what they actually stand for. Let's come back on the um, send of the, of the stage to talk a little bit about polling with regard to some of the issue areas in the world regionally. We, uh, I think it was Dean who talked a little bit already about NATO, and I think Carol did as well. But let's talk more specifically about Russia and Americans' views on Russia and how those do or don't look stable over time. What are you seeing in your polling? Well, in our polling, uh, we've, we've asked a question uh, over the years, is Russia seen as an adversary, a serious problem, or, or not much of a problem? You see a little bit of, uh, of signal in terms of what happened during the campaign with Republicans, interestingly enough, in the history of the Cold War, uh, becoming a little bit less concerned over Russia. Um, oh, oh, you know, our, our most recent poll, uh, interestingly enough, showed that, that Clinton supporters were more <laughs> likely than Trump supporters at the very end of the campaign to regard mm -hmm. Russia as an adversary. The dominant view in, in both parties is that it's a serious problem but not an adversary. So you saw a little bit of a signal there uh, on it. Um, you know, I don't think this was a, was a major issue or a major, major concern, but, but you know, you see some blurring of the lines there, which is very interesting. And again, I think it, it goes back mm -hmm. to some of Trump's, Trump's rhetoric and messaging and, and his relationship with Putin. And, yeah. I, and I think this is another change uh, from, from certainly the Cold War, where, where, where this was a huge ideological divide and Democrats and Republicans took very different views. Yeah, so um, right after uh, 1990, uh, attitudes towards Russia had improved post-Cold War, but then in 2014, once um, in our first survey, it was right after uh, Russia invaded Crimea. Um, at that point, we saw opinion of Russia among Americans fall to Cold War levels. 
um, and it's now at 40%, uh, sorry, it's now on average Americans on a temperature reading put Russia on average at 40 degrees, which is pretty cool. Um, and they, Americans don't trust Russia. We just put out a paper um, in concert with the Levada Institute in Russia. Russians also don't trust Americans. It's on this, the mirror of each other. Attitudes towards about the United States have also fallen since the Cold War ended. Um, but Americans do not want to contain Russia. They think that we should cooperate with them and work um, on constructive engagement. But like Carol said, it's interesting. Um, as far as a military threat, Americans don't think that um, what they're doing in Syria, what Russia's doing in Syria or in Ukraine is a direct threat to the United States. So, um, mm -hmm. so in that way, they don't. Have and, I, and I think the question going forward really is is kind of Article Five commitments mm -hmm. under NATO and things like that. And, and, I, and I just think we don't know until until mm -hmm. those situations arise. I, I think. There's a lot of doubt about that. I think, you know, Max is right to refer to the history. That, you know, Russia, you know, by millennial generation and others, Russia's seen very differently than it used to be. So we just don't know. We see this broad support for NATO as an institution. I think there's some uncertainty should push come to shove in terms of really the, the, the obligation of NATO members to come to the defense of others. You know, do, do Americans still support this, and what are the divisions over that issue? Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, can I just ask one Please. question? Because you've been talking about yeah. uh, attitude towards Russia. Yeah. Well, what about American attitudes towards Putin? Because right. uh, my understanding is uh, he has pretty damn low right, approval ratings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is striking to me because uh, Trump, during his campaign, would not say one negative word about Putin, literally not one negative word. I was watching for it. He had negative words to say about everybody else, about lying Ted, little Marco, crooked Hillary, everybody else, not one negative word about Putin. And when he was even challenged on Putin and said, you know, asked, uh, you know, what about the fact that he kills dissidents? His reply was always, well, we kill a lot of people too. Who are we to talk? So it was, it was extraordinary to me that this was not something that was in any way calculated to help him politically uh, because there is no, as far as I know, no real uh, pro-Putin constituency out there, but this was obvious. I mean, this was something that was obviously from the heart and that he actually has admiration for Putin. And I think, you know, the question is how that plays out in the uh, in the actual policy sphere, where obviously the people that he's appointing, like Mitt Romney, calling Russia our biggest geopolitical rival in 2012, do not share that rosy-eyed view of of Russia's uh, dictator. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That a lot will depend on, on where Trump takes the yeah. relationship. And it's also Putin was the first one of the first leaders to congratulate Trump, too. Mm -hmm. And I know from Russian public opinion, they think that uh, Russians think there will be improved ties. So it'll be interesting to see what Americans think. And also, we, neither of our organizations have yet asked about mm -hmm. Russia's meddling in the no. American election, no. and that might right. be, maybe That's they will right. see may have an more effect of a some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's take probably the even trickier issue of China, um, where I, I'm, I don't even know how to frame a question uh, accurately, because I think the polling goes in all kinds of directions on China. Um, I'll just actually start with Trevor, because I recall in your piece, you, taught, you gave China as a specific example of where millennials want more cooperation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I think they're, uh, as long as the polling is holding, uh, st still the only group of Americans who are more likely to say that China is a partner than a rival. And again, you know, it's, it's instructive to imagine what a kid growing up in the uh, late 90s or early 2000s sees China as the, ho as the source of the iPhone. I saw it as the source of Chairman Mao and the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. Very different. Um, you know, so China's always been a, a major power to younger Americans, always been, uh, you know, at, at least a not, not only negative uh, place in, in the world, uh, the source of many things, and also in some strange way, because of the internet, uh, closer than it was for older Americans. China was a very long way away, uh, you know, when, <laughs> when right. we were kids. And, and today it's a push of a button to find out about China. So I, I think millennials are just much more um, comfortable with the idea of China on the world stage. When you ask them if they're willing to share power with another country of China, they're mm -hmm. more copacetic with that. 
Uh, they're much more likely to study Chinese in school, which I thought is very interesting. They're more likely to say Asia is important than Europe, completely the flip-flop of older Americans. Uh, they don't necessarily support Obama's military pivot to mm -hmm. Asia, but the idea that the United States should focus on a Pacific century or what have you does get support among millennials. So it, it's, it will be interesting to see. Does that seem consistent with what we, how you two would assess uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, we found a lot of that. Those, those uh, same actually, trends. you found it. I just right. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, no, a lot of those same trends among, uh, among millennials. I, you know, I think it's interesting that China didn't come up as a major topic in the campaign. Yeah. But, but you know, the, one of the things I wish we knew, I mean, you know, we all, both Dean and I, I, I you know, we talk about the, the attitudes towards trade generally. I think given the importance of trade now as, a, as, a, as an issue, we want to do more focused questions, I think. And one of the things I'm really interested in going forward, if Trump <coughs> follows through, obviously, on significantly higher tariffs on Chinese mm -hmm. goods. I mean, this is something that, that I think Americans don't really, the, mess, the majority of Americans don't understand either the implications of this or, or what it might mean for the future. And so. You know, this this is this is a I think a good a good jumping off point to say that we need to do more on this and really try to understand what what's driving these attitudes and also what, what people think about specifics. Uh, you know, in terms of higher tariffs on goods, renegotiating NAFTA, things like that, because mm -hmm. at some at, at it's very soon, these sort of general themes that Trump has enunciated during the campaigns are going to or not going to become specific policies. Mm -hmm. On, on, oh yeah, please. On, that, on China, yeah. you know, I think one of the challenges that we see is um, we, when we make the foreign policy case on trade um, for TPP, <coughs> the argument has been this is either our rules or China's rules, right? That we stand for a certain amount of liberalism in trade, we, we stand for certain standards. The Chinese view on that is, is, is not that. It's sort of a let other countries do as they will. Um, they don't have the same sense of protections. And, and we made that argument, and trade didn't do very well this, mm -hmm. this cycle. Um, and then after the election, when you saw Trump saying he was going to step away from some of the things like the Paris Climate Accords, you saw the Chinese actually step forward and say, hey, you sign this, we're going to hold you to this. And so there's an interesting shift in dynamic as you see China stepping into its role and um, the renminbi entering the reserve entering reserve currency status and there's some real questions about how do we approach china as china views itself as much more of a global leader um, and and much more of a peer than a little brother on on the world stage mm -hmm. um, and I, i'm not sure that we really understand all of that um, i also think that you know the idea of tariffs and the rest of that driving up cost of goods for americans right. uh, i think it's very unlikely um, and so I think for the foreign policy establishment, to the extent that you are making a security case around a Chinese adversary, you may not have the support of the American people for major increases and buildups um, in the Pacific if people are not going to view China as the bad guy. Well, they make a distinction yes, between economic and, and military um, rise. Americans make a distinction. But I'm not, I was going to say, well, if if China then comes around, if the TPP dies, and then China comes around with their trade deal that's going to right. increase their power vis-a-vis um, -vis the US too. Can I just jump in quickly yeah, please, on, on both ahead. Russia and China? Uh, because I think what you've seen over the last decade or so is uh, growing power on the part of both Russia and China, and a growing willingness to challenge the US and our allies in the international world order that we champion, and I think what I and a lot of other people are probably looking for the next administration to do is to push back a little bit stronger and to hold the line against these growing threats uh, to the Pax Americana in both East and West. And that was, frankly, something I anticipated that, uh, that Secretary Clinton would do if she were elected. Now, in the case of Donald Trump, complete wild card, obviously, because if you take literally uh, his campaign rhetoric, he's going to have the biggest giveaway we've ever seen to Russia. But again, as I keep stressing, the people he's actually appointing to office are not going to support that. And so it's unclear what's going to happen there. Uh, I think in the case of China, he also had very little to say about uh, the security threat. He talked a lot about what he perceives to be wrongly, I think, the economic threat of China. To the extent that he talked about security, he talked about withdrawing US troops from South Korea and Japan, which would be 
a dream come true for Beijing, uh, and one that I hope he will not actually carry out. But I think there's a huge question mark as to whether, because I mean, those of us on the more conservative end of the spectrum have thought that President Obama was too accommodating uh, to Russia and China, and we're looking for a, a tougher approach given the, uh, uh, the willingness of, of both of those countries to push their neighbors around, as we've seen in recent years. And I think, you know, with Trump, you can argue it either way, that he has a certain pugnacity. He's talked about increasing the defense budget, which if he carries through with it would be a good thing, but it was very much open to question given that his priority appears to be this massive infrastructure spending program, and it'll be very hard to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure and also a large increase in defense spending. Plus the tax cut. Plus the tax cut, right. So it'll be very hard to, to, to balance all that out. So there, I mean, but, but there, I mean, there is some reason to think that he might actually stand up to some of these revisionist powers, although there's also reason to fear that he will be, you know, much more of an appeaser to them uh, than, than we have been in the past. So I think, big question mark. So that's uh, actually the perfect segue to the last question I'm going to ask before we turn it to the audience, which is um, back to the issue of terrorism, um, which as we showed in our setup video, the polling indicates a very strong, really strong uh, American public concern about terrorism. That certainly, at a minimum, even if you don't believe it, polling data has been a uh, a strong theme in the Trump campaign, and even you could argue in the early appointments that we have seen on the national security side, a sort of a counterterrorism focus. Um, so I think there is this question out there about, you know, first, um, how do we put the terrorism, counterterrorism, uh, foreign policy agenda into perspective with other priorities, and you've just named several, let's say counter Iran, counter Russia, counter China, there are others. Um, what is there a consensus, if any, for, and where can a new president sort of, whether there's consensus now or not, lead the American people in terms of each of these priority areas, understanding the, the strong concern that Americans appear to have about terrorism and his commitments to focus particularly on the counter-ISIS um, strategy. So let me start with Mika, and why don't we go down the road that way. So I think on terrorism, it obviously remains a very high priority for the American people. Um, it wasn't actually the number one issue coming into the um, election, but what we see typically is that in the wake of a terrorist <coughs> incident, a terrorist attack where you have fatalities, um, concern spikes and terrorism jumps to the number one issue that's on people's minds. Um, and we see that people feel it in a very personal and visceral way. In the wake of the Orlando attack, we saw that 50% of the people thought that they or a family member were going to be the victim of a terrorist attack. So it wasn't just the idea that like there's going to be a terrorist attack out there, but they personally felt threatened by that. So I think that that puts terrorism very high on the agenda. The problem is in the wake of a terrorist attack, which we expect another will come, um, people get to a sort of irrational place in their search for solutions on terrorism. And so you get a very, um, an acceptance for overbroad approaches, approaches that may not actually meet the, the solution or meet the problem at issue. And one of the other things that we see on that is that there's a tremendous partisan divide between how people understand terrorist attacks. So for example, when you look at public opinion on the Orlando attack, you see the majority of Democrats viewing that as a guns issue and majority of Republicans viewing that as a terrorism issue. Depending on how you see the problem, that will lend you to a different set of solutions. And so if you see it as a terrorism issue and a terrorism issue of people from other parts of the world coming here and committing terrorist attacks, then it's a right, close the borders answer. But if you view it as the problem is that people have access to weapons with which they can harm and kill hundreds of fellow Americans, then your response is to try and do something about access to that kind of capability. Um, but in either way, because of the partisan divide, some proportion of the electorate is going to feel like the solution offered does not meet the problem that they, that they see. And that, that has some real challenges for policymakers as they try and wrestle with this. Yeah. Trevor. Yeah, I think, yeah, Mika hit a lot of that right on the head. I think one of the challenges for, 
for Obama has been, I think his instincts are to do less than Bush did, but he ended up doing as much uh, in many regards in expanding the war on terror in other ways, although I guess he didn't invade too many new countries himself. Um, but uh, I think the, the big distinction, as Mika was getting at, is Americans are pretty supportive of sort of immediate retribution. And you know, if 9-11 happens, everyone's going to hold their hand up and say, let's go get them. Um, that's the next day, though. It, the question is, what do they support next week or next month? And if you look at the polls, for many years now, the majority of Americans have said that both the war in Afghanistan and Iraq are mistakes and not worth it. Uh, so there's a point where a president has to, you know, I don't know if it's an art or science of governing, but there's, there's the right amount, and then there's um, well beyond that in terms of public opinion. So, um, you know, the, when pollsters tend to take these polls, you often get what looks like very high so levels of support for things that I think aren't probably very good ideas. Um, so. okay. Max, and then I'll come back. Well, to I think one positive thing about Trump and one thing that allowed him to uh, score political points uh, during the, what allowed him to score political points during the campaign was that he was, you know, seized with the urgency of the terrorism threat in a way that the public did not perceive President Obama mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. And I guess the fact that Trump regards it as a major threat is a good thing, but uh, there are two major problems arising from that because, A, his preferred solutions would probably make the problem worse, not better, uh, because the things that he talked about in the campaign are basically stigmatizing Muslims, barring Muslims from the United States, uh, launching you know, indiscriminate bombing raids, uh, torturing, killing relatives of terrorists. I mean, if he actually did that, uh, you would see a massive backlash that would uh, vastly hurt our counterterrorism efforts. Now, the good news is he's kind of walked away from that over the course of the campaign. And you know, he's shown, I guess you would say, an open mind on some of these things like uh, <coughs> In, during the, uh, his interview with the New York Times editorial board, for example, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden after you know, espousing uh, torture worse than waterboarding for a year, he says that a, you know, a five-minute conversation with Jim Mattis convinced him that torture may not be the way to go. Uh, Jim Mattis other, is a very persuasive man. He is. He, is. <laughs> um, he went in with six I mean, the other thing is that by prioritizing terrorism over other concerns, which is something that I perceive uh, General Flynn uh, has been associated with and probably would want to do as a former uh, JSOC targeteer, uh, there is a danger that you lose sight of the bigger strategic picture. Mm -hmm. And I see that, for example, in the fact that Trump suggested that we should get together with the Russians uh, to fight ISIS in Syria, which is not what the Russians are doing in, in Syria. But if you see the whole world through that narrow anti-ISIS lens, you can lead yourself to take some very counterproductive uh, policy steps. And I think that's going to be a major danger that he will basically eschew our broader security commitments around the world in favor of a very narrow counterterrorism focus where anybody who helps us to kill terrorists is good. And that can risk empowering some very dangerous powers in the process, which I think we need to be very wary of doing. Dina, you wanted to add Yeah, something. I just wanted to say Trevor's right that um, support for large-scale, uh, protracted interventions are, are not popular. But Americans, for some time, in both our surveys, I think, have shown that they do support low-cost, what, what, small low footprint. risk, yeah, yeah low-risk, lesser cost than a full-out war such as airstrikes and drone strikes and targeted assassinations and um, blocking terrorist financing and uh, even sending in troops as a little bit more than half overall now. But um, so they do support these less than uh, enormous mm -hmm. obli obligations, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, current, the current military operation uh, against ISIS draws bipartisan support. I mean, there's no question about that. There are a lot of <coughs> Republicans don't see it as going particularly well, and there's a criticism of the administration on that, but there is bipartisan mm -hmm. support for the current action against ISIS. When you turn to terrorism at home, as, as the panel has noted, that there is big differences in, and almost two to one opposition for singling out. Muslims in this country for uh, for extra scrutiny simply because of their religion. Terrific. Well, I've got the pollsters on the stage, though. I have to complain. <laughs> I've been trying to write something about 
America's shadow wars and how the public might or might not at all think about them. Um, Yemen, Tunisia, right. Somalia. Uh, you guys don't ask any questions about these places. I understand why, but it's really hard to write about what the data <laughs> says when there's no data. Well, I looked I, it up in the, I, the yeah. Roper Center. There's yeah. literally no questions about uh, doing anything in Yemen yeah. or Tunisia. I, I'd it? like to, to know an awareness. I'd like to do an awareness measure about yeah, right. Americans' yeah. awareness of military operations, operations in those countries. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have any expectation about what we find, but it, it, it yeah. may be very low. Yeah. I'm just guessing that JSOC would prefer that to be the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going uh, to make sure there's time for audience questions. So the, uh, when I call on you, the mic will come, and please state your name and affiliation. It needs to be a question, and uh, one question. So we'll start right here. Hi, my name is David Michaels, and I'm with the Defense Department. Uh, clearly, when we look at the electoral map, we generally see blue on the coast and red in the middle. And I'm wondering if the polls, rather than looking at the factors of political affiliation, if we looked at things, variables like geography, rural versus urban, income level, if those uh, answers might tell a different story than the ones that are told here, or maybe do you think it would be similar? Thanks. Well, first, first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend the polls first. Okay, um, you know that we can get into a long debate about what happened with the polling on 2016, but most of the national polls were pretty close to the mark. Yeah. You know, as we see Clinton's lead grow in the popular vote, many of the national polls had her winning by three, four percent. She's up to maybe one and a half, two percent. That's that's pretty close. It was the state polling and the miss of. Of, you know, I think it's interesting. I won't go too far on this, uh, but we talk about it a lot in my institution. Uh, but uh, where the misses were, were there a lot of disproportionate numbers of, of uh, less educated white voters? And I think the, uh, some of those state polls did miss there. Um, I mean, I think in terms of the divide, you're right about the rural urban divide, but also the education divide. This is something we've been watching for a while and in, in American politics, and we've seen a greater ideological difference between less educated adults and, and better ed educated adults, with better educated adults being more liberal. Especially middle. around white. Yeah, yeah and, and now you see it in this campaign where, where I mean, the, the number that jumps out at you from the exit polls is Trump's 39% point advantage among non-college whites, uh, you know, it, it just just uh, stunning. And, and the expectation was that Clinton may actually, she was, she was expected perhaps to eke out a narrow victory among, among whites with a college degree or more. Um, she didn't end up doing that, which may have been a factor at, at, the, end of the, at the end of the campaign, but she, she only lost by four percentage points there. So you can see that enormous gap. Uh, education gap that's really, it's, it's almost uh, become one of the defining characteristics of American mm -hmm. politics today. Can you just address the income question? Did you all see well, uh, well, it's, many it's, divides it's, by income? I, I mean, we've seen, we've done some analysis, we've seen some analysis that suggests that education is even a bigger factor than income in, Amer in politics. Yeah. It I is, and a lot of the early analyses of the Trump voter we're saying that this is the, the working class with lower incomes and that did not hold up in data that basically the Trump supporter on average had incomes like every other average American. Good, okay, another question. Let's see, I've got one all the way over here. And the mic is coming and then we'll come up here. Oh, hi, Augustus Salzona. Um, this time I'm wearing my um, um, I'm an elected official with the uh, state GOP in, in the state of Maryland and a longtime conservative uh, grassroots activist here, um, and who happens to be an immigrant from the Philippines, <coughs> has been around this Washington since 1955, seen presidents come and go, goes for Philippine presidents too. Anyway, um, uh, that being said, I think I do find it interesting because uh, in, in the Pew poll, I did notice there was a swing in the Catholic vote, and I can tell you this as, as one of those who worked with the analysis to, as to who we should, we should target, and uh, I predicted the Trump victory when he appeared before the Faith and Freedom Coalition and addressed those issues of importance to the quote-unquote values voters, which have sort of been neglected, and the, the elites here in Washington misses completely. I think Howard Dean said it eloquently once 
on the opposite said, guns, God, gays, and abortion. And that's how we got is your our base votes. Is your question about the role of religion? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, my question is that, is how, could, how did you all miss that? Uh, that, that those the underlying thing, and of course the uh, courts too. Supreme Court, uh, just the passing away of, of Justice Scalia, how that had a profound uh, effect so on us getting our vote. Maybe social issues and religion, the extent to which rather than foreign, if I can reframe in terms of this debate in this room, right, right. Uh, relative to the issues of foreign policy, how much do you think people are really starting to divide based on social issues and or religious um, expression? So in the exits, you don't see those issues rise in the <coughs> people's top priorities. Um, again, economy, uh, terrorism, immigration, it wasn't, right, it, it may have been an issue for some people, but it wasn't one of those things that they were listing in the exit poll. So it's a, it, it may be a sleeper issue, but it wasn't something that people were really focused no, on. And people generally don't yeah. vote on issues. It's usually yeah. more partisan. Partisan affiliation is usually the strongest predictor. And then Trevor and then Carol. I, I, was just, I mean, Trump's a Democrat from New York, so I don't know. You know. <laughs> I mean, Married three times. I, I think it is extraordinary the, the degree to which some of these values voters um, kind of suspended their doubts about Trump at the end of the day. And I think that's particularly true among white evangelical voters right. who, uh, who voted for him in very high numbers, despite obviously having doubts about uh, some of his behaviors. Okay, uh, we have a question right up at the front here. There's a mic coming. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I've had the impression since I have millennial kids that they don't have any time to keep up with the news. I mean, truly, no time to keep up with the news. Their lives are so frantic. And my concern is that the way the news is presented, it's so complicated, it's hard to sort it out. And we don't explain the complexity, the interrelations. A lot of it, need, from my perspective, is that it needs to be done visually so you can, under, you can recognize the piece parts that are, that are basically related in this. And I, so it makes me worried about What's the-, the question? Is Well, the question it makes me worried about the polls that you don't ask them how much they know about what's actually going on. Okay, do you ask how much people know about what's going on? We, we do and we will. We, we, we think that's, that is a hugely important issue, uh, what you're talking about. The, 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 the information environment, what, what I'd really like to be able to know, and this is a mission impossible for a researcher, do people know more today than they did 30 or 40 years ago? No. <laughs> and that's, a, that's, harder, that's harder to measure than you might expect. Well, I'm sure yeah. it's hard to measure, yeah. but I'm just, I'm making observations. Yeah. So, it's also about it's what? I think we know a lot more about the Kardashians than we did 50 no, years no, ago. No, I mean more about, better informed about yeah. politics, international yeah, affairs, foreign policy, things like that. You're right, a lot of the news that especially young people get is lacking in context. Coming, coming through digital sources, a variety of digital sources. We all know about Facebook's problems with fake news. We also know about the polarized news sources. So I think it's a, it's a more fraught environment today. Than yeah, I was going to say, it's not just the young people, it's that people seek out information from sources that just reinforce their, the views they hold already. Right, right. I would also say on that, one of the things you have to be careful of in polling, and we saw this when we were looking at the polling on the Iran deal, the amount of information given about a particular policy in the question itself will have an impact on the results of the question. So when you ask people whether or not they supported <coughs> or opposed the Iran deal, just that, you saw that it was below majority support. But when you saw questions that said, do you support the Iran nuclear deal to right, dis, uh, dismantle the Iranian nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief, support went up over 50%. The question itself was educating people, but it masks sort of what you're talking about, which is a base level of awareness and knowledge that may not be there when people go to the polls. Yeah, yeah and academic research suggests, I think, an answer, a partial answer to, to Carol's question, which is I, I think people are not more educated about the world than they were before. They know different, a basket of things, but in general, no. But I think one thing that we do know is that there is a bigger gap between people who know a lot 
and mm. people who don't know very much, it's so easy to get informed now for someone who cares that you have the world at your fingertips. So I think the informed people know more than they ever do. But because the media environment has fractured into so many different parts, as Dina said, you can, you know, you can read all day about underwater basket weaving if you want. Uh, so people do. People now choose to read uh, and watch entertainment and, and self, you know, the hobby sorts of topics. They, they don't watch general uh, you know, issue and interest programs, so they're not catching news um, you know, by accident anymore. And so I think your average American probably knows less uh, about public affairs. And then just specifically about young people, they always know the least. Uh, that's not mm -hmm. unusual. That's every generation. Yeah. I, mean, I, think there's yep. two, I think there's two related problems. One is this uh, shocking, fa uh, shocking failure of, um, of civics education, uh, where you know, surveys show that uh, college students don't know, you know the half century in which the Civil War occurred or other very basic facts. They have no idea what the First Amendment is and so on and so forth. So you've had a shocking failure of civics education, and then you had the phenomenon that was just alluded to with the kind of narrow casting of news and the prevalence of fake news or heavily slanted news, uh, which I suspect is a bigger problem with older people because mm -hmm. like, if you look at the audience of uh, Fox News, for example, it tends to be like 60 years old. Uh, so on both sides of the age divide, you have a lack of, of, of quality information, uh, which I think is going to have very deleterious long-term consequences for our democracy. OK, next question. I've got one right here. Uh, yep. Hi, Kevin Meister, recent graduate from Geneva. Thank you for this interesting panel discussion. I just want to first reassure you by saying Facebook is not our main source of news. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I have a chat, right? Snapchat. Oh, yeah. It's Snapchat. <laughs> My question is, uh, what is the American public's perception of torture? Uh, you know, do they see it Great as question. justified or, or unjustified? And do they perceive waterboarding as being torture? And also, since you mentioned terrorism, what is the impact of uh, terrorist attacks that occur in Europe, especially on the scale of the Paris and Nice attacks on the American public? Thank you. Who wants to start on that? Dina? We asked uh, about a series of actions the United States could take in response to terrorism, to, to combat terrorism. And uh, torture was one of, a majority of Americans overall oppose it, but Republicans do support it. That was the one um, item of differentiation between Republicans and Democrats on that one. Uh, that along with limiting refugees coming into the United States, that was another one that Republicans opposed and Democrats supported. You may have asked about what yeah, it's a very it's a very obviously a very difficult issue uh, for Americans you know I, you do get, you do see some division you see partisan division or, or, or we haven't asked about that in a while you know that was it was actually you know 40 percent or more said that it could often or sometimes be justified but we didn't lay out the specific circumstances for that I think I think I think after some of the revelations, and we haven't polled since then, the, the, the Senate committee's investigation of the CIA uh, t tactics during the, the, the Iraq war. I, I, you know, I, I, it, it's, I think support probably is a little bit lower today than it was uh, prior, you know, say a decade ago. Uh, but I also think it's a very difficult question to ask Americans about because the, the, the circumstances matter so much. Is it a ticking bomb in New York that you need to find information about, or is it just a routine practice? I think that's very hard to get at in a public opinion survey. But I would say on that, I mean, the, we released a report on this. A lot of Americans' views about the effectiveness of torture are actually defined by the portrayal in media and mm -hmm. particularly in entertainment. So people believe in the ticking time bomb situation, it's effective because if you torture the guy, he'll break and tell you everything because that's what happens when you torture the villain and he tells you his whole plot. But it doesn't actually work that way. If you're a terrorist and there's a ticking time bomb, you're just going to stay silent until the bomb goes off because that's your goal anyway. And so people don't really understand what the incentives are. Right? This was Mattis's point to Trump, is that the rapport building approach works is much more effective to get the person to agree to, to cooperate with you as opposed to coerce them to cooperate with you where they may give you false information. Um, but to your question about Paris attacks and overseas attacks, what we've seen in the data is that um, there are a couple of factors that will send um, the American political system into panic. One is whether or not Americans are killed. Um, the other is level of fatalities. 
Paris, however, even though it wasn't inside the United States, was one of the highest salient terrorist attacks that we've seen since 9-11. Um, you know, attacks that happen in Baghdad, in Kabul, don't really register, but Paris was a particularly high salient terrorist attack for people. Um, and what we saw is the panic hangover lasts about 12 weeks. Interesting. Okay, let's come back. This direction all the way in the end there. Nathaniel Fritz, graduate student from Syracuse University. I'm curious if we have any data that talks about the influence of foreign travel on people's perceptions. Uh, personally, I know that the largest divestiture from myself and my peers back home was after I went to Afghanistan, and then recently having gone to Korea, I see that I feel further and further removed from my friends and family. So I'm curious if we know that foreign travel has a specific impact upon people's perceptions of America's role in foreign policy? I, you know, we've tried to get at that. It's very difficult because of um, who you are and whether you're, uh, you know, foreign-born or native-born. And, you know, I think if you, if you, you know, I, I can recall surveys from years ago that, you know, if you have a demographic, do you have a, a, a valid passport, typically you see those with, with valid passports being more supportive of international engagement. I mean, generally speaking, but those people with valid passports could be you know, kind of a very diverse group of people. Yeah, I think, I mean, if your point is about, if, if you're trying to get at whether contact with other people makes a difference, I can speak to the immigration data that shows people who live in areas that are integrated mm -hmm. are more positive toward immigrants. Um, versus people who live in isolated, homogenous communities. Mm -hmm. So it's a similar thing. Okay, I come over on this side. See if there are any questions to my right. If not, I'm going to swing back to the left over here. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Parlay. I'm a millennial American. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my question is regarding faith and government institutions. Um, I'm curious to see whether or not that breaks down by age. Uh, do younger people support government institutions? And I ask this sort of in this, in this landscape of the fake news stuff that comes out. Um, and, you know, so are young people's perceptions sort of, you know, are they more disenfranchised by the government and stuff because of the fake news and the post-fact world where you can kind of get away with saying non-factual things politically? I, you, I, oh, go ahead, Trevor. I'm with, sure. Yeah. Without quoting from specific polls that I hope they'll talk about in a minute, um, I, I think there are a couple of things from what I have read um, that go to that question. Interestingly, uh, millennials are more supportive, I think, on average, of big government solutions, mm -hmm. um, you know, despite this overall sort of cratering of support uh, in, in government generally. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at their enthusiasm for Occupy Wall Street, and for certain other things, I mean, they, especially on the economic front, uh, they're looking for help um, because things have been tougher for them than for most generations starting out. So uh, I think that, that may have tempered what other things would have been going on otherwise, you know? Uh, I, at least that, and, and I think like for some other things, like their confidence in the military is just as high as other Americans. Um, so I don't think they're really too different. Too different. Well, their, their support for activist government, though, they still, there's still a distrust of the institution, and a lot of institutions among millennials. I mean, you know, especially, you know, religious institutions to the point earlier that they're more likely to be religiously unaffiliated than in older generations. But I think it cuts across all institutions, even, even to a certain extent government, even though they support activist government in a lot of areas. Okay, all right, and I have another one right over here. Thank you very much. My name is Janet Fleischman with the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the issues of global health and development, because we've seen in some of the Kaiser polling that global health goes, um, you know, ranks fairly high in terms of uh, Americans' perceptions of what the government should be involved in. And I wonder if you could speak to, particularly at this time, those issues of global health and international development are, have been seen largely as bipartisan issues, and how do you see it going forward? Thoughts, anyone? I mean, it is actually striking how bipartisan the government action has been from the Bush administration as an example to the Obama administration in this space. 
Um, it, I think one of the challenges with that is a fairly low salience issue with the public. The specific issues of global health and global development is sort of a, underneath a larger umbrella of foreign policy and diplomacy. So I think it's it's hard to measure. I, have, I haven't seen a lot of data. I don't know if you guys have asked the question specifically on that issue. Yeah, I mean, Americans think it's important to combat hunger and, and things like that. But I think a lot of it would depend on cost. If it's low cost, you know, like humanitarian crises, for example, American support sending US troops to help with earthquakes and things like that. But it does tend to be the case, as I recall, this is, ends with the question mark, that Americans tend to think we spend a lot more on yeah, development, true, are. than we actually do. That's so true. there is a there is a disconnect. A disconnect, yeah. Okay, well, let me just uh, close this session out by thanking this incredible pa panel um, for their insights today, for sort of meeting the challenge of crossing from the polling data into the um, analysis of foreign policy. Um, we are going to take a few minutes as we reset for um, Congressman Mike Rogers. Um, and so in the interim, please join me in giving a round of applause to this great panel.